take a moment to pray together and then we will get the class started. So um, just wait for the recording to come on. It's a little slow, I think. Um, got a message that Airtel is having some problems to side, so. Maybe, okay, fine. All right, so can somebody please pray with the class and then we will get started. Can somebody pray and we will start. Okay, Samuel, would you like to pray please? If it's okay. Sure, Pastor. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this time that you've given us and this opportunity to gather together in your name mm. and uh, study from your scriptures, um, prepare ourselves. We prepare ourselves, we prepare our hearts. Mm. We commit ourselves to you and we commit Pastor Ashish into your hands. Uh, may your spirit be amongst us and teach us, guide us, um, give us wisdom and understanding. And everything that we learn today, may we be able to use that in our lives for ourselves and um, for the calling that you've called us for. This and everything we ask in your name. In the precious name of Lord Jesus. Amen. 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 Thank you. Amen. Okay, so welcome everybody to the class uh, BC 209. Uh, we're learning about holiness. So what we've done is uh, we broke this course into three sections. First section was just to understand the holiness of God, or at least to get some insight on the holiness of God and uh, the fact that he's made us holy to himself. Um, second section, we spent a little time on discussing repentance, recovery, and restoration, where we just emphasize the importance of repentance in the life of um, the believer. And now we're in the last section. We were talking about overcoming. Just uh, trying to understand practically how to overcome. Um, and we, we're talking about overcoming the flesh, our own flesh, the world, the influence of the world, the pressures, the cares, the world. And then the last part we are going to talk about is overcoming the devil. So as we were discussing overcoming the world, uh, I think we had some questions from last class, uh, which um, I would uh, request Christopher to ask. And I'm not sure if anybody else had some questions towards the end of the class, which uh, we didn't have time to pick up. So let's uh, answer those, address those questions. Let's listen to the questions first, then we will try to answer them and then we will move forward. So Christopher, please um, go ahead and share your question with us. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Pastor. So uh, this question is really to the point that you talk about on being uh, spiritually minded and earthly wise. And uh, this is specifically in the area of uh, being or becoming you know, prosperous, and uh, you know pertains to uh, you know the aspirations and prayers of, of both the leadership and the church as well as as well as the congregation. So um, uh, we do live in times where you know some churches are in survival mode, face financial pressures, and some of them even they close down. And um, I know that you know uh, EBC Church you know provided uh, quite a large sum of money to support churches and pastors during COVID, uh, you know to help out in, the, in that particular area. Um, so there are also churches somewhere in the in somewhere in the mid range, and um, uh, if we sort of go to the other end of the uh, spectrum, there are these mega churches, and uh, some of these churches even preach this uh, prosperity theology. There's you know the prosperity Bible, uh, where they you know they sort of um, uh, align towards financial blessings that are always kind of the will of God, and that you know faith positive speech, donations to religious causes will increase uh, one's uh, material wealth. 
Likewise, the congregation also may link the donations to their, you know, to their continued prosperity of getting them to become rich. So I just wanted to kind of understand, you know, how do we sort of strike a balance of being prosperous uh, or still being in the state of not being prosperous, uh, both on the spiritual lives of the, of the church leadership as well as the congregation. Um, so, you know, like how much is enough? And um, maybe you could you could also touch upon this uh, this Bible verse, you know, which I think sometimes has been a, a, a bit of a guilt trip in some in some denominational churches, where you know Jesus had said uh, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of, kingdom of God. So yeah, that's basically the, the question that I, that I had. Hmm. Yeah. So, um, yeah, let's see you now how to put this um, in a very concise in a concise manner because oh, yeah, it is a big subject. Um, there, there are a lot of um, you know a lot of aspects that need to be addressed and covered. But let's put it like this: um, uh, God blesses His people. Right. That's throughout the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. God is a good God and he does bless his people. And we all pray, oh, God bless us. Or, you know, that means let good come to us. Let good happen. When you say God bless me, you're saying, God, let good things happen to me. Uh, you know, whether it's physical, emotional, financial, social, what are so many things. So God is the source of all good things of blessing. Second, God is not against wealth or money or healing. He's not against it. He He provides for His people. So, and and practically, we need money to, you know, to live and do just go about life and, you know, do these things. So, money is needed, and God provides. Uh, so that's again very clear and. Uh, the normal way is that um, God has ordained for all of us to work and then we earn, you know, God gives us the power, you know, to make wealth. That means you, we all do whatever we work uh, we have. The farmer does his farming the, and the, you know, people are all involved in various things. So, and, and God blesses each one of us in our work so that we can have enough for ourselves and to give into his kingdom. So that is also uh, part of what we see in scripture. Now, how much is, is enough uh, is something, uh, you know, uh, I think it's variable, you know, it's, uh, and it all, it all boils down to the heart of the person the heart of the person. So you think of a farmer, he plows his field. Uh, sometimes, you know, he may have a 30-fold harvest. Sometimes he may have a 60-fold. Sometimes he may have a 100-fold. Uh, it varies. And in all things, he blesses God. Uh, same thing in the life of God's people. There are some who, you know, have enough for their lives and they have some extra which they can bless others with. There are some who are very prosperous. Now they are, they love God, they all love God, but some, you know, have a huge surplus, huge amounts. And they're so, it's not their fault. Maybe they're successful in business, maybe... You know, maybe they started a business that's really successful, and so they have huge amounts of surplus. And so, then, what do they do with that? You know, of course, they can give into the, they give into the kingdom of God. They give to help other people, but you know, they may buy three cars and three houses. Okay, I mean, you can't fault them for it. That they're just doing well. I mean, they they may have been very successful in whatever they're doing, so they're doing well. So, and both are believers. You know, the person who is getting by month to month. The person who is very prosperous, both are believers, 
you know, uh, uh, so the, uh, we can't fault either person. Uh, we can encourage the person who is just getting by saying, look, God can take you to better places, give you more. Uh, and of course, each one of us has our responsibility in that. So we do. So, you know, I think that is all variable, but it all boils down to the heart, right? What the scripture is teaching us, especially First Timothy chapter 6, tells us, you know, to avoid the love of money. You know, there's nothing wrong in having money, just don't love it. Don't let it control you. You, you use it wisely, to, to use it to bless people, all of that. But I think where we could go wrong and where the you know, like you mentioned in the, in the whole prosperity teaching. So there's nothing wrong in telling people or teaching people God will bless you and uh, teaching people what God has told us to do with money, which is to give into his kingdom, to give to help others, to give to the poor and needy. I mean, those are things the Bible teaches us, so we teach people. There's nothing wrong with that. But I think where the church has gone wrong in the past and probably continues is that when we, when we do certain things, like one, equate money, how, how wealthy you are, to how rich you are. Now, that equation is wrong, right? And James chapter 2 very clearly tells us, you know, there are those who uh, may be poor in this world, but they are rich in faith. So we don't equate that, right? That's not a linear equation. Yeah, that you have greater faith, you have greater more money. No. Of course, we can have faith and believe God to meet our needs. But it is not always true that if you have more faith, you will have more money or that having more money is some equa uh, equals to greater faith or better quality of faith or whatever. You know, so that equation is wrong. Secondly, I think the motivation in giving, you know. Uh, our motivation in giving should be love, out of love for God and love for people, right? Of course, we know that God has said that if we honor him with our tithes, he will open the windows of heaven. Yes, we know the scripture says, give and it will be given to you. Uh, the scripture does say that, you know, he who sows bountifully will reap bountifully. I mean, we know all those things, but still our motivation to give is not purely to get, but our motivation to give is love and to bless others. That's it. So that's another area where we could go wrong. So first, area the church has gone wrong and could go wrong is when we somehow equate faith and money. We know we can use faith to have our needs met, but that does not, we can't extrapolate that to say uh, that having more money means you have better faith. No. The second is the motivation in giving. Our motivation in giving should be pure. I just want to glorify God. I just want to bless people. And of course, I know God will provide and God will multiply the seeds I sow and all of that. And uh, so the motivation in giving is not just to get. The motivation in giving is to bless. Right? And uh, I, I think somehow the third area where we could go wrong, especially from a ministerial side, is... Uh, when ministers have an affinity to the wealthy. Uh, and that is actually, you know, James writes about that. So don't do that. You know, don't give preferential treatment to, you know, those who are wealthy. And uh, No, no, no. So you ask people where to, where to treat everybody equally, you know, not on the basis of um, money. So that's, again, a problem that we see in the church that uh, ministers are, are, you know, somehow, of course, it's, you know, it's connected back to, okay, if I have more money, I can do more things. So I need to befriend those who can give more money, et cetera, et cetera. You know, it's kind of like a, uh, uh, a, a, a sad and vicious circle that people, sometimes preachers and ministers get trapped into, which we must avoid. So answer your question in a very, you know, short and simple and concise way. Yes, God is a good God. Yes, he blesses people. And we must realize that as believers, 
there's this wide spectrum. There are believers of people who, in, in terms of fin finances, there are those who have just enough, those who have surplus and some who have abundance, overflowing. Okay, and they're all believers. They love Jesus. We don't, uh, you know, we just thank God for their lives, what God is doing. And, and then uh, there's nothing wrong in believing God to meet our needs, to give us what we need or to give us more than what we need so that we could give extra to others. Nothing wrong with that. We must have faith in God. But we have to avoid these pitfalls so these very obvious dangers when it comes to money. And I, like I said, if that single thing, if we say, what is the most important thing? Well, just guard your heart, right? Um, um, Jesus put it like this. He said, uh, and uh, this is in Luke 12, he says, a, a man's life does not consist of the abundance of things he possesses. You know, I'll give you the, I think it's Luke 12, 15. Let me just check that. Yeah, Luke 12, 15. So, you know, I think if Jesus has summed it up. He said, you know, beware of covetousness because a man, one's life does not consist in the abundance of things he possesses. That means you don't measure your life by your wealth, you know, basically. So, keeping our heart pure and, you know, understanding things clearly is, I think, very important here. I uh, hope I addressed your question, Christopher. If I left anything out, you could, please. Uh, yes, uh, if you could just uh, touch upon that um, that Bible reference, uh, Pastor, uh, about the camel uh, and the rich man. Uh. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, you know, so the, the, the context there is this uh, rich, uh, this rich young ruler who comes to Jesus, who says, you know, Master, you know, I've, I've, I've you know, he, he lived a good life, meaning in the sense a, a godly, I would say, a, a righteous life, a good life, a decent life. You know, he kept the commandments. Um, but then the Lord said, okay, you know, give your wealth away and come follow me. Now that's the acid test for him, right? For others, it might be easy to do. They don't have a whole lot to give away, so it's easy. You can just give it away. But this man had a whole lot. But not only did he have a whole lot, but he was attached to it. So that's the issue. So that's one thing he couldn't do. He did all the other things. Right? He, he followed the commandments. He treated people well, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But there's one thing. He was attached to his wealth to the point where his wealth controlled him. So Jesus said, you know, you give what you have and come follow me. I mean, that's the test. Let me see if you can release it. And he couldn't release it. And that's when he said, Jesus said, you know, it's so difficult for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle, giving us a comparison. You know? So the point is, we should not let our wealth control us. And the best, the real test for us to know that wealth doesn't control us is, is seen in our ability to give it away. Right? That means we're holding on to it loosely. We are holding on to it more from a point of stewardship. That means, God, this money, we stewards. For example, you know, the way we work in church, I am very strict with all our staff when it comes to spending money. Now, sometimes our staff can, you know, um, get the idea that, okay, we have a lot of money we can spend. But I'm very strict. And when, you know, um, even if it's a small thing we want to buy, so you know we have to ask questions. You know, why do we, why do we need to do we really need to buy it? Is there another way to do it? Yeah, you know, and then and then yeah, okay. So basically, I want everybody uh, on the team to understand that uh, we don't we can't waste money, right? Uh, even if it's in the name of God, uh, even if it's in the name of ministry, don't waste it. Right? You ask questions. Be a good steward. So from that perspective, we are holding on to it very tightly. Why? We want to be good stewards. But when it comes to giving, we, have, we hold on to it very loosely. That means when God tells us, you know, give to help somebody, of course, give. Don't hold on to it. And don't worry about, you know, don't make a big deal about it. Just give. So 
there is that balance, right? I hold on to it tightly because I want to be a good steward, but I hold on to it loosely because I don't want it to let money control me or control us so that we can just give it away. So that's the real test. And this man, this rich young ruler failed that test. And that's what prompted Jesus to state that it's so difficult for the rich people. Why? Because it's very likely that it's the wealth that's controlling them, you know, rather than them controlling the wealth. Yes, thank you. Okay. You're welcome. All right, Abhinash, let's see. Um, can you explain a little more about engaging with the world as a believer? How we can conduct ourselves there and when we should draw the line to maintain a Christian life in the areas, the corporate sector, arts, etc. Yeah. So, so we are in the world. Uh, and as believers, we have to interact with the world. But um, we, so as we interact with the world, our, our goal is to bring kingdom influence into the world. That means, <coughs> excuse me, we live by the values and the principles of the kingdom of God. We cannot compromise that. Right? And we bring those values and principles into the kingdom, uh, into the world. And we don't let the world influence us. Right. So. Uh, uh, so this this applies to, you know, all all uh, walks of life. So if, for instance, if a businessman, right, uh, at, you know, if a person is engaging in the world and like I think one example we said, you know, um, even in if he's a salesperson or whatever, in you know, different things, uh, there could be situations where, you know, uh, there's conflict, you know, between the standards, the values, what the world wants you to do. That's when you have to hold on to kingdom values, kingdom standards, and say, no, I'm not going to compromise. I'm not going to do things that are dishonest, unethical, you know, those kinds of things. And then in other uh, area, other industries, especially you think about entertainment, you think about uh, arts, uh, you know, you think about those other areas, okay, like fashion design and uh, clothing design, fashion design, and you know, so many other things where, uh, uh, it, there, you know, it's, it, you're really close to a fine, you know, the, crossing the line where you could go from, decency to indecency right in say example clothing design fashion design or in entertainment or those areas so that's where the believer has to say look if if a believer is called to you know work in those industries okay i'm in this industry i'm going to be salt and light i am going to make a difference here but how i'm going to live by kingdom values and principles and I'm not going to cross the line uh, in these areas, right? And I know some of this is very subjective, meaning you know we can't we can't just make a law that it's it's from situation to situation, and, and every believer has to be careful. Uh, the goal is you know um, to express the kingdom of God in those situations. Okay, did I? Is there anything I left out? Do you want me to just address the be nice? Okay. All right. I see your response in the chat. All right. Any other questions on overcoming the world before we move to the next chapter on overcoming the devil? That will be our last uh, part that we need to address as far as you know, engaging the world and overcoming the world, the challenges. Any other questions on that? Okay, so let's move now to the next chapter. I'm going to share. PDF. Right. So we're going to talk about overcoming the devil, right? So we dealt with overcoming the flesh, which is our own evil desires. 
we talk about overcoming the world because you know we have to interact with the world now as long as we're here on earth and this is the last section overcoming the devil and how, what how, how do we deal or how do we live victorious over the devil now we all know and these scriptures are very familiar to us that we have an adversary the devil and uh, you know he has uh, one intent to destroy our faith to get us away from our faith in the lord jesus christ so he's against that that's his main intent get us out of faith in god but then the bible tells us to resist the devil right so he's going to come against us but our uh, we've been equipped by god empowered by god to resist the devil and he's going to run from us right so uh, both james and peter are teaching us you know resist him resist the devil right you stand against you oppose now he's coming to the devil is trying to devour you know he's trying to see how he can get us out uh, from the faith but uh, he, we we stand uh, against him resist him so what we must understand uh, in this whole conflict uh against the devil is you know it's good to understand some of his tactics you know how does he operate what are his you know what are his most common tactics so that you know we can just recognize hey that's the devil and i don't have to give in to it right so how does he try to destroy our faith or devour us well yeah just by looking at his names or titles in scripture uh, it gives us some idea of how he operates so he's called the tempter right so obviously that means he's going to present us with temptations uh, he's going to draw us out in areas of weaknesses and draw us into sin and go against god he's an accuser so accuser means he's going to rail against us with all kinds of false accusations slander us demean us devalue us condemn us make us feel bad and terrible about ourselves and before god you know that's his job accuse make us feel condemned he's also a deceiver that means he's going to tell us untruths he's going to tell us lies and try to get us to stop believing the word and believe his lies now obviously in his attempt to deceive us he is going to he's not going let me say he's going to package the lie as though it was a truth so that's deception what is deception lie comes packaged as truth so it looks like truth you yeah. know see if if a lie came to you as a lie it's very easy for all of us to recognize it and reject it so that's that's very easy but that's not how we operate the deceiver packages the lie as though it was the truth you know so we think it's the truth we are convinced we are believing the truth but actually we're believing a lie and that's when that's what deception is all about and so we have to be very careful and lastly uh, another one of his names is adversary meaning opponent he hinders he opposes he obstructs he puts roadblocks he tries to you know uh, either tries to uh, derail us he tries to distract us he tries to you know uh, get us off track or destroy us that's that's his work as adversary so if you look at these four titles it kind of these four titles kind of capture the the the, the gamut the range of operations of the enemy this is how he works he either he's tempting us accusing us deceiving us or opposing us right any point in time this is what he's up to so our first strategy in living victorious over the devil is to recognize what he's up to because if you recognize it hey i know that thing is the devil you know half the battle is over 
right? The moment you recognize something coming your way as a temptation, it's, oh, that's, that's the old devil he, he coming, presenting temptation. Or oh, that's just an accusation of the enemy. That's an untruth from the enemy, a lie. Or oh, that's the enemy trying to oppose me. I'm not going to let that happen, right? So just thinking very strategically, thinking like um, a, a soldier, you know, thinking that way is you will identify, okay, that's the devil. He's up to something. I'm not going to let him win. Right? Because the moment we recognize any one of these things, we, we know how to overcome. You know, God has given us his word uh, to overcome each of these things, whether it's a temptation, accusation, a deception, or an opposition, we can overcome. Right? God's given us, he's shown us in his word how to overcome. So part of us, uh, part of our responsibility is just recognizing what the devil is doing. Okay. So here's what I want to share with us when we are standing up against what the enemy is doing. First and foremost is we must be absolutely convinced in our hearts that the devil has been defeated. Okay. The devil is defeated. As far as you are concerned, as a New Testament believer, whenever you think about the devil, always think of him as a defeated enemy. You know, sometimes believers, you know, we talk about the devil as he's so big, he's so great, or he's doing this, he's doing that. And, you know, I feel sad. So, like, why, why are we magnifying the devil? He's a defeated enemy. Jesus Christ defeated him. And if Jesus defeated him, that's it. He's been defeated. And I'm going to look at him as a defeated enemy. I'm going to deal with him as a defeated enemy. I don't need to magnify the devil. Right? I know that he has these tactics. He has these strategies. And that's what makes him look very powerful or very strong. But if you look at it, all these are very petty, petty things. Temptations, accusations, deceptions. And uh, these oppositions are more like, you know, uh, uh, intimidation rather than actual strength. Okay. So his, his opposition is more of an intimidation rather than actual strength. So when we look at all these things, like, look, these are petty things, uh, but, uh, you know, he, he just appears to be very strong. But the truth is, Jesus Christ defeated Satan on our behalf. So if you go through the scriptures, He's literally, look at the, 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 what the text, the, the scriptures say. You know, he's been crushed. He's been expelled. He's condemned. That means in the court of law, the case, the verdict was announced 2,000 years ago. And the verdict is the devil's condemned. You and I are justified. So there's no more court cases. You know, There's no need to go to the court to fight the devil. That took place 2,000 years ago. God dealt with it. He's disarmed. As far as the believer is concerned, he's destroyed. He's rendered powerless. So this is the enemy. This is the truth about the enemy. Right? Now, if you don't know this, he's going to make himself appear much bigger and much more stronger and much more powerful than he really is. But this is the truth. And... Uh, we must be established in the truth, right? So God's delivered us from the powers of darkness. He's delivered us from the authority, the dominion of darkness. We are in the kingdom of his son, which is much greater than the kingdom of darkness. Uh, Jesus disarmed principalities and powers. Right? Jesus destroyed him who had the power of death. And he's given us authority to, to trample on serpents and scorpions. This is absolute mastery, absolute authority, trample on. Right? And over all the power of the enemy, over all the power of the enemy. Right? And uh, Romans 16, 20, the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet. Notice, he's going to crush Satan 
under our feet. Right? Jesus crushed the devil, and now he's saying it's our turn to crush the devil. Right? So these are the scriptures that, that, that show us this is how we must perceive, look at the devil, and this is how we deal with them. So never, never brag about what the devil is doing. Now, recently we were sitting and listening to one person and this person was talking about like, oh, you know, this thing happened and that thing happened. And, and I was like, you know, oh, just talking about all the bad things that were happening in their house and in circumstances and the devil did this and the devil did that. I know it's a devil attacking and I don't know the devil is using that person and I know the devil is using that person to trouble me and using that person to trouble me. And now, I, I did not rebuke the person because, you know, this person was much older and I did listen quietly. Uh, I can't just say, hey, please don't talk like that. Uh, so, I, but it was very sad, you know, and this was an elder person. I couldn't, uh, um, you know, uh, I had to just be polite. But, but really, it's very sad that as believers, we would talk like that and make the devil look so big. No, as believers, so the devil is defeated. And he may come against me with temptation, accusation, with uh, uh, intimidation, or that's opposition, or he may come against me, uh, we said, with trying to deceive me with all our untruths and lies, but we know the strategy, we know he's defeated, and we're going to walk in victory, right? So secondly, be aware of the tactics. How does he operate, right? So Paul wrote about this in 2 Corinthians 2.11. He says, lest Satan should take advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices, his operations, how he works, what are his tactics? Ephesians 6.11 talks about the wiles, the tactics, the strategies of the devil, right? So we must be aware how the devil operates. You know, what are his strategies? What are his uh, tactics so that we can preempt what he would attempt to do? Right? So as believers, we don't have to be ignorant. Now, if we are ignorant, that gives the devil an advantage. And that's part of the problem with many believers, right? They're ignorant, so the devil has an advantage. But when we know what his devices are, when we know his tactics and his strategies, then he no longer has an advantage over us. Right? So if you try to understand you know, how he operates, or how he could possibly operate in the life of a believer. We, we said the four things he tries to do, right? He tries temptations, accusations, deceptions, and in, um, intimidation or opposition. He tries these four things. How does he try to operate or how does he work? Well, first of all, he plays mind games. Secondly, he looks for open doors. And thirdly, he tries to intrude. That means forcibly try to come in. So, either in any of these, you know, four ways he, he thinks he's doing, he, sometimes he plays mind games. That means he's just throwing these things in our mind. The mind games. The thoughts, imaginations, arguments, reasonings. It comes in the mind. So that's where he tries to make his way. So how do temptations come? How do accusations come? How does deceptions come? How does intimidation come? Mind. He puts thoughts of fear, accusations. One. He plays mind games. So first thing, be discerning about what comes into your mind. Don't fall for anything and everything that comes to your mind. Be discerning. Hey, that thought, that's not from God. That accusation is not from God. Or that intimidating thought is not from God. 
that thought, that that imagination that's in, that's instilling fear in me, that's not from God. So it's the devil playing mind games. So that's the first thing, his first wave operation. Now, again, here, many believers don't recognize it. They keep falling for these thoughts, these ideas, these imaginations, these arguments, these reasonings. They come into their mind, and that's the first step to being trapped by the devil. Second is open doors. That means if we give an open door, the devil will come in, right? So how do we provide open doors? Usually it's through our continued sin. So the moment we do something wrong, the moment there is sin, turn away from it, repent and renounce it. That's why repentance is so important, the previous section that we talked about. Because repentance keeps the door closed to the enemy. If I don't repent and I continue in sin, it's like I'm slowly opening the door. And soon the door is wide enough for the enemy to come in. That's why Paul wrote in Ephesians 4, verse, I think verse 27, he said, give no place to the devil. Give no place. I mean, don't give him a foothold. Don't give him a point of entry. Don't give him any way that he can get in. Right? So we must be careful. Right? Through our sin, through our wrong, believe, uh, wrong believing, we open up the doors. And he looks for open doors. And lastly, he will try to intrude. That means he's going to try. He's a trespasser. He's going to try to trespass. He's going to try to violate knowingly. So when you know the truth, he's still going to try to violate that. Come against. That's why we got to stand firm on the truth we know. So recognize his strategies, where he's operating, and be on guard. So that brings us to point number three, which is we have to be vigilant and give the enemy no opportunity. I'm going to stop here and see if you have any questions. We will take up point three uh, from next class. I guess that might take up time. So let's pause here. Let me just see if there are any questions in the chat. Okay. Uh, everyone with me so far? So what are we saying? We're saying... We need to know how the enemy operates. How, what are his operations and how, what are his tactics? You know, so his only, his only strengths are temptation, accusation, deception, and opposition. That's the four things he tries to do, main things against the believer. How does he operate? He plays mind games. He looks for open doors, and then sometimes he tries to intrude in our lives. That's how he works. How do we approach him? Well, first and foremost, know the devil's defeated. Okay? You are defeated. Jesus Christ defeated you. Second, be preemptive. And that means you think one step ahead of the devil. And hey, I know this is my area of weakness. My area of weakness doesn't have to pull me down. I'll be on guard in my area of weakness. I'll be watchful. I, am. I, will, I will recognize when the enemy is trying something. I mean, and my recognition of the enemy is not to magnify the enemy, but to defeat him. I don't have to brag about him. I just like, oh, that's the devil. All right. I know how to deal with that. I know what to do. I know that if I put up the shield of faith and use the sword of the spirit, he has to go back. He has to flee. So I'm watchful. We are watchful. We recognize not to magnify the devil, but to put him down. Right? So we'll go forward on this on Monday. Uh, any questions so far? You're all with me so far? Go ahead, Samuel, please. Thank you, Pastor. Um, Pastor, uh, I don't know if this is a topic that we'll be covering in the coming days, but um, something around uh, spiritual warfare. 
uh, and I'm I'm looking at Ephesians six twelve, where you know uh, that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but but against principalities, against powers. So so on this top, would you be spending some time on this, and how does this happen, and uh, what does it look like? Mm. Um. Uh, I, I, I actually didn't plan to, um, you know, like deal with it in, in, in a comprehensive way, but we can definitely talk about it. So uh, let me say a few things here and then maybe we'll continue it on Monday. Uh, you know, spiritual warfare basically is conflict against the powers of darkness. And uh, for every believer, what we just spoke about, that's about 80 to 90% of our spiritual warfare. Right, that is in dealing with these things the temptations, the accusations, the deceptions, and the oppositions. That's about 80 to 90 percent of spiritual warfare for every believer. Okay, this is what we're always in all the time engaged in, right? So it's not very complicated. This is what it is, and every believer is facing this day in, out, day in, and day out. Uh, we, it's a spiritual warfare. We're dealing with powers of darkness. These are the evil spirits, powers of the air that are doing this against us. And they are looking at these three things. They're playing mind games. They're looking for open doors. And sometimes they try to intrude. So that's 80 to 90 percent. Then there is the other aspect, I would say, you know, the remaining 10, 20, 10 to 20 percent, which we do when we're engaged in ministry. That means while we're ministering to others. So that's the other aspect, the other dimension. And in that 10 to 20%, we may need to minister deliverance to people, meaning that we're helping people who are troubled by wicked spirits, evil spirits. So that's part of our conflict with demonic powers helping others, dealing, overcoming evil spirits, and also through prayer and intercession. So that's, that's another aspect where I might be praying for people, and in the process of praying for them, I'm actually dealing with what the devil is doing, whether it's at an individual level or a group level. Right? But I put that down as 10 to 20% because... We are not doing that all the time. You know, what we are mostly involved in is this at a very personal level, what we just spoke about. So 80 to 90 percent somewhere. And then depending on how much of ministry somebody is doing, to that extent, we're actually in conflict with demonic powers as we are ministering to people and so on. Uh, so we can talk a little bit about that next, next week and any specific questions in that area. All right, let's pause for now. Um, and we'll, it's going to be a break time and then you need to get ready for your next class. So we'll pause here. Uh, somebody could please close in prayer and we will continue this uh, next week. Could somebody please close in prayer? Okay. Why is there such a quiet? <laughs> Who wants to pray? Okay, I'll pray, sir. Go ahead. Okay. Heavenly Father. Thank you, Father, for your your heart we thank you lord for your grace lord that you mm. you've given us lord so that we may walk in your ways lord mm. and as we live in this world lord even though we are not of the world lord we know there are challenges there mm. attacks lord there are things that are in our ways lord that try to stop us from worshiping you and following you in a way that pleases you lord 
we pray, Father, that you continue to empower us, Lord, and guide us, Lord, mm. so that you will be, be fulfilled on this planet, Lord, through us, Jesus. We pray, Father, that you be with us again until we meet again next week. In your mighty name, Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, everyone. Uh, have a quick break. Uh, please uh, uh, yeah, enjoy your remaining classes today. Have a good day. See you all again next week. God bless. Bye now. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.